Don't you love that upbeat giving music? You can give with energy, right? Um, one way, Cassandra, that you could channel some of that amazing creative energy is we are going to have a Thanksgiving dinner this year. And last week, we had a centerpiece contest that was less, yeah, that was not last week, was it? We didn't do that last week, so you did not miss out. Last year, for the first time ever, have you noticed the Abbey has a lot of creative energy? It really does. And um, wasn't worship amazing? Speaking of, I'm looking forward to that worship night. But last year, we did our first ever Thanksgiving centerpiece contest. See the quotes? Contest. Meaning we had prizes, but it was mostly for fun. So I don't know. I'm thinking maybe she could give thanks for Star Wars and that the Death Star is destroyed or something. So, you know, be thinking about that. We had a lot of fun with it last year. We, we, uh, we just love to release God's people to be who they are. And we believe that God's put more inside you than you even know. And so God knows how to challenge you to bring out what's inside you. And even some of these fun things we do at church, you never know. You never know what you'll discover if you just look inside. I'm convinced that the greatest unexplored territory is right in here. The kingdom is within you, and God has no problem talking to you about you and showing you where you fit, and when you worship, that's what what happens. So we have been doing this series, and you can go ahead and put my title slide up there. I've quit calling it Worship Up. If you've been here for a few weeks, you've heard that, but we've been talking because our theme for the year is up. We're going up, and so obviously worship is directed up. Today I want to talk to you about what I'm calling the Eureka Effect, worship and the word. So buckle your seatbelts and we're just going to go for it. Go ahead, Carla, you can give me that first slide. You probably heard the word Eureka. It means I found it. It comes from the Greek Eurisco, which means to find. Anybody ever been to Eureka Springs, Arkansas? Uh, We actually went there on our honeymoon. So I know, it has a special place in my heart. But the word Eureka is, or at least this story, is famously attributed to the ancient Greek scholar Archimedes. And now this is probably legend, but it's fun, so go with me. He was asked in 250 BC by the local king to determine whether a crown was pure gold or not. He was working hard on this progress. uh, problem because nobody yet knew how to do this with the physics of the day. So he took a break to go to a public bath, as you do. And when he climbed into the bath, and there are drawings of this on the internet, but I spared you from them. (laughs) When he climbed into the bath, he suddenly realized that the water level rose equal to the amount of water he displaced with his body. Now, that's, you know, basic physics, but no one yet knew that. Prior to this, no one had discovered how to measure the volume of an irregular object, so it was a breakthrough. According to the legend, he was in the city, the ancient Greek city of Syracuse, and according to the legend, he shouted, Eureka, Eureka, and went running out into the streets of Syracuse naked, as you do. And, by the way, Eureka is also the state motto of California, for other reasons, which were gold, right? So that's the, that's the famous story of how that word originated. But we also call it, you can go ahead to the next one. We also call this an aha moment. And the fame of the aha moment is attributed to Oprah. But it's actually a psychological effect. It's called the Eureka effect. It's known as an aha moment or a Eureka moment. And what it means is it refers to the common human experience of suddenly understanding a previous incomprehensible problem or concept. It is also known as insight or a word that some people have grown tired of, epiphany. Anybody heard anybody go, I'm having an epiphany. I've heard that people are tired of that word. Anyway, (laughs) conflicting results exist as to where it occurs in the brain and it is difficult to pinpoint the circumstances under which it occurs. So there's this thing that happens where you get to an impasse and you turned it over and over in your brain and you walk away from it and (gasps) aha. And you know what? To this day, science can't figure that out. You know why? Because we are more than meets the eye. We are more than meets the microscope. We even apart from God, we're still crafted in an amazing way where we function 
And if you work and work and work and work on a thing, you need that burst of insight to break through, even apart from God. How much more is that true with God? Because you're not just pulling from your own insight, you're pulling from his resources. So it's this balance between using your brain and zooming out and seeing his wisdom, right? And that's what happens so often in worship. That's what we're going to talk about today. Let me tell you a little more about this aha moment. Um, you can leave that slide up, but I'll just tell you a little about it. It can be looked at as two phases. Now, see if this relates to any problems. Am I in the right crowd? Has anyone here ever had a problem? Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I am in the right crowd. So if you've had a problem and you've needed a breakthrough, the first phase of this aha experience, listen to this, requires the problem solver to come up on an impasse where they become stuck. And even though they may have seemingly explored all possibilities, they are still unable to generate a solution. <laughs> Anybody ever been there? Anybody been there on the inside? We've all been there. The second phase occurs suddenly and unexpectedly. Y'all, I'm just reading psychology stuff here. We haven't even talked about God yet, and yet this is how this works. It's so similar to how God works in us. After a break in mental fixation or reevaluating the problem, the answer is retrieved suddenly and unexpectedly, the aha moment. Some research suggests that the insight problems are difficult to solve because of our mental fixation on the inappropriate aspects of the problem content. <laughs> Have you ever fixated on little bits of the problem you can't do anything about? We fixate on the wrong stuff and therefore God can't get the, the wisdom through to us until we let go. In order to solve insight problems, one must think outside the box and then listen to this statement. This brings it all down. Insight is believed to occur with a break in mental fixation, allowing the solution to appear transparent and obvious. Isn't that amazing? Doesn't that describe breakthrough so well? Uh, when Chuck Yeager broke the sound barrier, he said it was like a poke through jello. His plane rattled and shook, and it was like an impasse. And then the minute he broke the sound barrier, oh, this is great. And that's what God has for you. And he's so good that when you get in his presence and worship, those things pop off. And you see things clearly. And the fixations you've developed on your problem break when outside of that experience of worship, you were just trying to even unfixate and you fixated on unfixating. Anybody ever done that? Yeah, this is what God has for you. I call it a right brain burst. But it's so much more than just your own wisdom. But again, even in the natural, do you know... Any chemists among us will love this story. The rest of you pretend to love it, please. <laughs> the structure of benzene. Benzene's a six-carbon ring. So chemistry knew there were carbons, but chemistry didn't know that they could make a ring. And a man named Kekule <clears throat> was sitting by his fireplace at the end of a day, and he was working on this problem and working on this problem, and he dozed off, and in that hazy state between waking and sleeping, he dreamed of a snake and he saw it like biting its own tail and he went, it's a ring. And that's how the benzene ring was discovered. Isn't that amazing? No one knew that carbons could make a ring before and that, if you've taken any chemistry, that changed all of chemistry. Watson and Crick, when they were working on the structure of DNA, now we're all like gaga over the double helix. I am, like honestly, there's double helix DNA jewelry and I would own it if it cost less. <laughs> There's all kinds of double helix things. <clears throat> but in the, back in the 50s, before that breakthrough was made by Watson and Crick, nobody knew what DNA looked like. And there were crazy postulates about what the structure of DNA could be. They didn't know it was this beautiful double helix. Watson was playing tennis. Cambridge. He was at Cambridge. He was playing tennis. And on the tennis court, he had an aha moment. And he went double helix. And the story goes that he came running into the local pub where all the Cambridge scholars were gathered and shouted, it's a double helix, and the rest is history. And now we've mapped the whole human genome. Wow. Isn't that amazing? So this is even in the natural, y'all. This is people that weren't seeking God. So I want to tell you, how much more is it true for those of us that have 
the wisdom of God connected to our backside. If you're in a, if you're in a new creation, you're in union with Jesus. The Bible says that. So you have this amazing access. So worship helps us lose our fixation on our problem and have a eureka moment. How awesome is that? Um, and this happened, Psalm 73 is a picture of a psalmist named Asaph. The next, uh, there it is. Then I entered into God's sanctuary. Then I understood. That's a documentation of an aha moment, of a eureka effect. And this psalm, if you read it, I won't take the time to read it. I was going to, but I have it open on my Bible here on the stand so that you'd know that I did read it beforehand. <clears throat> But the, um, our internet was down, and so I'm using paper things, like old school, a heavy Bible here this morning. But you know what the whole of that psalm is? He was mad that the wicked were prospering, and he had fixated on that problem. If you've ever been jealous, uh, yes, repent, yes, get healed. But also read that psalm, because like... <laughs> Asaph was going to town on doggone it. And he even gets to the point that he said, he said, he's starting to say, what's the point of me serving you, God? He's really getting dangerous. Like he needs a one-on-one. -on -one. He's getting dangerous. And then right in the middle of that, he's just, why are the wicked? They're getting blessed and I'm doing worse and blah, blah, blah. It's verses and verses of it. And then he goes, wait a minute. Then I entered God's sanctuary and yeah. then yeah. I understood now the Bible says then I understood their destiny or their end and then he goes on for several verses about how they're gonna like burn up in hell but <laughs> <laughs> but leave his situation out of it and just realize what he's saying is then I got in the place of worship and I zoomed out yeah. and I went wait a minute God you've got something to say about this and my feelings and my jealousy and my pain and my self-pity is not the end of the story and he had an aha move moment he had a eureka experience psalm 73 17 is a principle then i went into the place of worship and things got clear and that's available for you in the place of intimate worship not just in god's house not i mean not just in this building in corporate worship but in private too the ultimate eureka story in the bible other than resurrection, is Josiah. He was the king of Judah, and we call this the forgotten book. It is 2 Kings 22.1 through 23.28. It's also in 2 Chronicles 34.1 through 35.27. I always get the scriptures in there because I think somebody wants to go read it. 2 Chronicles 34.2 talks about Josiah. And this is an actual picture of Josiah. <laughs> CNN was there. No, wait, it was Fox. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> thank you. I'll be here all week, folks. Uh, <clears throat> the boy king, Josiah. This tells you pretty much all you need to know. If anybody recognizes the beginner's Bible, I raise my kids on this Bible. It's lovely. It says, Josiah was eight years old when he became king. He was a good king. He obeyed God. Parts of God's temple were broken and old. Josiah got workers to build it back. That's kind of an understatement for preschoolers because parts of God's temple were overrun with prostitute cults and altars to Baal and as well as broken and old because they kind of go together. So Josiah was this eight-year-old reformer king. We've been talking about worship and we've been talking about the heart of David. Second Chronicles 34 2 says, Josiah did what was pleasing in the Lord's sight and followed the example of his ancestor David. So he did not turn away from doing what was right. Somehow, the stories of David and who David was and how David cared about the temple. We've been talking about how David organized the worship in the temple. That got in Josiah's heart, and so he cared. And so he started this program to reform Israel, but he started by be rebuilding the temple so people could worship. He realized worship was broken down, and he wanted to rebuild the house of worship. So Josiah gathered funds planned and began a temple restoration project. And so I picked this picture because it looks really messy and you can also see that there are altars to foreign gods right there in the house of God. That's amazing. He gathered all these funds from all the people of Israel and then he began a highly organized restoration project. It wasn't just, y'all see what y'all can do with this. I mean, he gave specific details. Again, 
He was walking in the ways of David. He had seen something in the heart of worship that David had, and he was captured by that heart. He, too, had a heart after God. But an amazing, amazing thing happened as they were doing this. 2 Chronicles 34, 14 says, When they were bringing out the money which had been brought into the house of the Lord, Hilkiah the priest found the book of the law of the Lord given by Moses. Josiah, this is amazing. Josiah would not have read this. These are words he had never heard because it had been totally lost to Israel. Lost in the temple. He then said to the royal secretary, I have found the book of the law in the temple of the Lord and gave it to him. The next slide tells us that the historian Josephus records that the book was actually found in the treasure chamber of the temple. According to Jewish tradition, it was found under a heap of stones where it had been placed to be protected from being burned by King Ahaz. Now, is this not a picture of kind of the Bible belt in a way? People know of the Bible, but have they really encountered the grace that's in it? It's kind of been forgotten in the in the, right in the middle of the church in many ways, and it's just feared as a book of law. In fact, I believe those stones, stones in the Bible often represent law. So the real truth of the Word of God is still in the treasure room, but sometimes it's buried under a pile of stones, which is a pile of legalism. It's a pile of reading the Bible through a lens of condemnation and fear rather than freedom and promise and faith. The, the book is still buried. It's amazing to me that this nation was trying to worship God without a book. Yeah. It's kind of like if you went to college and the textbook was too expensive, so you thought you'd try to take the course without buying the textbook. Anybody ever tried that? Somebody related to me is nodding right now. It doesn't, it doesn't work very well. You need the book. So I believe God wants us to rediscover the book. Psalm 119, 162 says, I rejoice over your promise like someone who's discovered great treasure. The book, the words of God, the words of grace, the words of freedom are still in the treasure room of the temple. And God wants to unearth it and bring it to you. So 2 Kings 22:11 tells Josiah's reaction. When he heard the words of the book of the law, he tore his robes. That meant more in his day than it would today. That meant I'm, I'm ripped to the heart. Today, we don't do that in our culture, but Josiah was trying to express, this has gotten to me. And the king went up to the house of the Lord, 2 Kings 23, 1, and all the men of Judah and all the inhabitants of Jerusalem with him, and the priests and the prophets and all the people, both small and great, and he read in their hearing all the words of the book of the covenant, which was found in the house of the Lord. It's fascinating that Josiah started reforming the temple and worship before he even had the book. But when he found the book, he kicked that reform into high gear. There's a long list I could read you, which also tells you how far gone. There actually were cult prostitutes operating out of the temple of God. He had to actually just clean house like no one before. But the words of the Lord, the truth of God, empowered him to make a clean sweep. Sometimes we're trying to clean our house without the power of those promises and we just feel like we're fighting against our own flesh. This Christian walk is not a fight against your own flesh. It's not just an exercise of your will. It is a release of the promise of God to actuate everything he already did in Christ. It's a release of his book in you. Jesus was the word made flesh, but you're the word made flesh too as you believe on him and walk that out. So this book is for you to get things cleaned out. It's a positive promise of what he's already done for you, walked out. And so that is an amazing story of the sort of discovery of the forgotten book. Focus on worship and you will rediscover the forgotten book. It's not just the Eureka effect of your own wisdom. It's the Eureka effect of God's wisdom, the wisdom of the universe, the vastness of what is contained in his words. Psalm 119, 130 says, The entrance of your words give light. It gives understanding to the simple. Other translations say, The revelation of your words brings light, and I love this, gives understanding to the inexperienced. 
Do you ever feel weak and small and you don't know the future and you don't know how to cope? The words of God, the promises of God have direct application to your weak feeling. And when it comes to you by revelation, when he imparts that to you in the climate of worship, you go, ha, ah, clarity, faith, courage, hope. It's what I need. The last uh, translation I quoted there says, the disclosure of your words illuminates. Now, the rediscovery of the words of the forgotten book seems to be a pattern with God. We just read how Josiah found the books of the law and reformed Israel accordingly. So that's a pretty big deal. Like he reformed uh, hmm, a whole nation. I'd say that's a discovery of a forgotten book, which we just marvel a second longer. They lost the Bible, y'all. They lost the book. They were, like, they were like doing business and being a nation when the whole charter of their identity was completely covered over with dust. Is that a little like the church sometimes? They're still doing their little business and doing stuff. But where's the charter of who you are and why you're that? Can we dig that out and blow the dust off? Can we read this? Can we get off the stones of law that are keeping people away from the truth that's shining? It's still in the treasure room. Don't be the church without knowing why the church be. Hey, I just said that right there, right now. That wasn't in the notes. Tweet that. Somebody tweet that. I like that. Oh, pardon me while I ponder that myself. So that was cool. He reformed a whole nation. And it was God's nation, and so he remembered who a whole people were. Kind of Lion King, but for a whole nation. But then, look at this. In the early 1500s, Martin Luther discovered one scripture, the just shall live by faith, Romans 117, and kind of helped birth a whole Protestant Reformation, which we're sitting in today. In 1900, a group of Bible school students in Topeka, Kansas, studied the scriptures about the baptism of the Holy Spirit because nobody was at that time and on January 1st 1901 one woman received it setting off the movement we also sit in today so the Bible is waiting in everybody's treasure room to be discovered now probably the greatest example of all was the Apostle Paul he was a Pharisee he was educated at the feet of Gamaliel in strict conformity to the law. He had a lot of stones covering his view of the Bible, okay? But when he got hit, knocked off his horse on the road to Damascus and converted to Christianity, Paul had to completely rediscover the whole Old Testament in the light of the cross because it was so covered over with his view that he had to actually go off into the desert of Arabia to be alone with Jesus to be personally taught what the scriptures actually mean like think of it you know Israel didn't think a Messiah could come and suffer that's why they didn't understand Jesus they thought he was going to come and set them free from the Roman Empire so all the scriptures about the death of Christ and you know they're all over the Old Testament going all the way back to Genesis 3:15, went right after sin where God came and he said he said, I'm going to put enmity between you and the seed of the woman, and he, meaning Jesus, he will crush your head, but you will bruise his heel. That's about the cross. Paul, before his conversion, knew all those scriptures, but he didn't know they pointed to the death of Christ. So he had a lot of relearning to do. He had a lot of delving into that treasure room to do. In fact, his whole mindset of what he believed about God had to be restructured and revamped. He had a lot of eurekas. That getting knocked off the horse and being blind for three days and accosted by the Holy Spirit was just the first of many Eurekas that the Apostle Paul had. So this is a pattern with God. And if we go on, one of the main roles of the Holy Spirit is actually to remind us of the words of God that we have temporarily forgotten. John 14, 26, but the advocate, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things. These days, we like to say all the things. He'll teach you all the things and remind you of everything I've said to you. What's that? That's his words. That's, that's his word ap applied to your life. This often happens right in the middle of worship. I bring a journal with me to worship. In fact, the worship night that we're having coming up, bring your journal. Bring something to write on. I don't know if you've ever seen me do that. I'm really not writing out announcements that come to my mind. Like, I'll just be worshiping, and all of a sudden, 
What? You know, uh, yesterday I couldn't get to the gym because I had a had an afternoon engagement, and so I just went and did some exercise in the park, jog, walk, things, and that's kind of worship to me. I've trained my heart to find God in that moment. It's an intimate me and God time, and right in the middle of that, I all I was stepping up onto a bench, up and down, up and down, strong legs, and right in the middle of all that, or at least going for strong legs. All of a sudden, I heard in my heart, and the Holy Spirit just whispered, that your joy might be made full. I just heard that scripture. And it all just unfolded in that moment. I realized, you know what, Perry Ann? I mean, it was just all so real. People want to put limits on people's joy, but I came so that your joy would be full. And you need to be aware of anything that tries to limit your joy because joy, if it's joy, if it's my joy, it's made to be full. It's made to fill every part of you. I know some Greek. I knew that word full means like every particle, every possible space. Ha! Ah, what's that? That's the Holy Spirit. That Take that, Oprah. How's that for an aha moment? Come on. Listen. Just know him. It's not hard. It's not you don't have to even get still and quiet. I was hurting and sweating, and he spoke yeah. right in the middle of that. He wants to speak. When you worship, when you build a lifestyle of communing with him, Paul's going to talk to you about that some more next week, the lifestyle of worship. That's next Sunday. But when you build that in your life, you will just find he's very talkative. Yeah. <laughs> he's very talkative. He really is. He just doesn't do it on demand like a slot machine. He just doesn't go, when you go, you know, like, like some, oh, oracle, speak to, it's not like that. It's in the course of living and communing and worshiping into who he is. Uh, Jude 1, 5, I love this. Now I want to remind you, although you once fully knew it. Isn't that cute? Hey, has any of you ever fully known something that the Holy Spirit might have later had to remind you of? I just love that. I love the gentle rebuke that's in that. Like, I will always remind you, you, you know, you, you did fully know this. <laughs> I love it because we're, because we've slept since then. And God knows that we're dust. And he knows that we're capable of laying aside the truth that we need in a situation. So he sent this amazing, faithful Holy Spirit to give us these aha moments that are not just the aha about what we have inside us, but the aha about what he has released to us through Jesus, which is so vast. You need a Holy Spirit to be your tour guide through it. Yay. It's so exciting. Okay. So John 4:24. Y'all all probably know this scripture. God is spirit. We're going to go through a little thought journey about this scripture. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. Good so far. Let's go to the next slide, and we'll break down those words. Spirit is the word pneuma, and I'm going to call it a view of ultimate reality as it exists beyond the visible realm. So if you're sitting here today with any problem, in the spirit, there is a view of you without that problem in Christ, right? You with me on that? Some of you might not be sure yet, but really, there's a view. There's a place post-cross where you exist without that problem. But in fact, there's also truth. And the word for truth is aletheia. Reality, sincerity, truth in the human sphere. Honesty, transparency. So in the spirit... I'm healed in this side of truth, in this honesty, the pain's not yet gone. I'm just using that for an example. You get me? Let's change that. Next slide, I changed it to spirit and humanity. Someone recently called it dust and deity. Dust and deity. Both coexist. Go ahead, Carla. Thank you. But you know what? That's where we get into trouble, and I put it in red, because somewhere between spirit and humanity, things we know are true in Christ, and yet my flesh telling me how I'm sitting here today, that's where contradictions exist. So I know grace is real. I know that I should have no worries, and that's true. But when I'm not walking in the consciousness of that, do I manage to worry? Well, I do. I do contradictions the word diction means saying these are things saying opposite things now that little diagram's too tame so go ahead how about that and for the sake of the audio I just made the arrow wider apart but 
I'll do with my hands the fact that sometimes our contradictions feel like really like an uncrossable river, right? Have you ever been in a place where you know the promises of God are here, true, and yet your experience seems miles and you don't know how you're going to get across that gap? God wants you to worship yeah. in the gap. Worship fills that gap. Worship is not just I'm standing in the spirit and pretending that other stuff doesn't exist. Worship is I'm boldly placing myself in the gap of my own contradictions. Lord, I know who I am and yet I doubt who I am. I know who you are and yet I sometimes wonder where you are. I have these contradictions and if I can place myself there and be honest, I'm in the zone. I am in the worship zone. That's what worship is for. That's how you mind the gap. In Britain, they have this... Uh, you know, if you've been to London and you get on the subway, it's just so lovely. They're so lovely in Britain. And so there's a crease like that wide when you step on the subway. And there's an audio and these signs are everywhere and it goes, mind the gap. <laughs> just like in America we'd go, watch it. But they go, mind the gap. <laughs> and so it's a thing. But listen, worship is always minding that gap. When you really get honest before God... If you're hurting, he reminds you who you are in the spirit. When you stand in that place of honesty, you are minding the gaps in your life. And the secret of the Christian walk is just minding that gap. And where the enemy wants to play is in that gap. And so if we commit to worship in that gap, man, we're going to go somewhere. We're not going to get taken prisoner. There's also another thing. There's something else in that gap. There's something else that bridges realms. Warning, mild science jargon up ahead. There's something else that bridges realms, and that is the Word of God. Yeah. The Word, like light, has, it has entrance in both realms. It's both a wave and a particle. Light is both a wave and a particle. That's true. That's not like faith teaching. That's physics teaching. Light is a wave and a particle. Okay, I put this little simple diagram because we just don't stop and think about it. This isn't hard. I started to say it's not rocket. I always want to say it's not rocket science. So I think, well, this is kind of rocket science. But anyway, anyway, a wave is energy. A wave is energy, right? That light coming down here is energy. But a particle is matter. And so everything is both energy and matter. That's what exists. Things are energy and matter. Light's both. Light is both. But guess what? The Word is both too. This Bible has a physical component. I can read these words. When I read the words of this book, the promises in it, like if you just go read judgments on ancient Israel, I'm not, has anyone done that? You try to read through the Bible and you get stuck at the judgments and you go, oh, this isn't blessing me. <laughs> but listen, they're, <laughs> they're in there for a reason. But I'm telling you, you've got to learn to relate to the book in both ways. Not just particles. You need the energy of God's grace that's in the book. So when I read this book, think of it. Imprints are made on my very physical eyes. And my brain actually makes sense out of this stuff I'm seeing. Which, do you know, that's all a chemical change. That's not just a wave. That's literal changes in my wiring, in my brain. And then if I go away and think about it, if I meditate on it, if I roll it over in my eyes, if I try it on for size. Meditating is just trying it on for size. Promise of God. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. How do you meditate on that? You go, how would that look? And you start trying it on for size. Because what if it's true? Because it is. And all of a sudden, it's not just particles. The energy of that truth starts taking you over, and you realize you're standing right in the contradiction, actualizing the Word of God. Here's a prettier picture. I like that one. So the fabric of space-time, what's really, what determines reality? Is it just energy? Is it just matter? How about both and all? How about everything? How about his word has authority all in all in everything we touch, both inner and outer? And you know, sometimes in the Christian walk, sometimes physical healing almost seems easier than those inner. Have you ever struggle with those inner motives and questions and feelings and oh, yearning. I want to tell you, the Word of God has authority over all of that. 
It can be a particle when you need a particle. It can be a wave when you, because it's like light. The entrance of his word is light. It has authority. It has weight. It has action in both realms. The word is in the gap with worship. In the gap of worship, when you're standing there, turn on your expector to hear God speak to you. Yesterday, he said, I was worshiping him as I exercised, and he said that your joy may be full. I know I told you that before. I just like saying it again because I needed to know my joy had been a little capped. Ah, that my joy might be made full. That was a wave and a particle. That was a stand in my contradiction. That was a renewal of something inside me, and that changes you. That's how we get where we need to go in the Christian life. Okay. You can go the next slide. It's time to rediscover the word in the spirit. And this happens in the climate of worship. It's time to dig it out of the treasure room and move off the stones of law and rediscover the word in worship. He wants to speak words into your gap. Jesus was the Logos. You know that John 1.1 says, In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. Jesus is the Word, the Logos, capital L. But that meant more to ancient Greeks than it does to us. We just know Logos and Rhema. We know some Greek. But in the Greek mind back then, the Logos was the whole mind of the divine. It was the whole big capital R reason. It was the ultimate explanation that is beyond all explanation. The Logos, the Word, was both, it both answered and eliminated questions. Do you get me? In other words, these ancient Greeks that were searching for truth, it was like, I am truth. And your little bitty question loses itself in the big picture of all that I am, as well as gets answered. It's bigger than our little questions. It's bigger than our gaps. It really is the reason, capital R, behind the reasons, and I'll quote a song lyric here, You are my reason for reason. Isn't that cool? That's Carlos Santana and Smooth. But it's a really good, it's a really good lyric. So he is the Logos. Now, the next slide. I don't know if any of you know it. Some of you are young. Some of you are uh, not quite as young. Some of you will know that along about the 60s, 70s, and 80s, there was this thing called the Word of Faith movement. Anybody know about it? Yes? Some of you are sitting here today because of it. I am. It was a move of God. It also involved, wait for it, people, which meant that there, were, there was a gap. So there was real truth. It was teaching. It was reality. It was word, 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 word. It was the word, the word, the word. Yeah? There were also people. So because of that, I'm just going to say, because I was one of them, it created some opportunities for people to be obnoxious. I was in the Word of Faith movement. It changed my life. I fell in love with Scripture. I'm pretty sure I probably was obnoxious. You can laugh. Okay? Listen, you know, they call, you've heard the term Bible thumpers? Usually when we say Bible thumpers, we mean somebody that's like condemning people and kind of like, you're wrong, get right with God, but, you know, all that. But we were a different kind of Bible thumper in the in these days. And so we just rebuked everybody if they made a bad confession. (laughs) I know, I know. We were turned on to the word and we were so excited that you could like, you know, like speak faith. And so if anybody said they were sick, I mean, you know, I probably wasn't as bad as I look back and think I was. We're all young. So you'd just be like, somebody go, I'm sick. And you'd go, I rebuke that. And they're like, you're weird. (laughs) Like, great event. Don't do this in the line at Starbucks. Don't do it. No, we found better. We've grown up. We've learned. We found better ways, you know. So we were obnoxious and sometimes annoying. We, we had a hold of a truth that the words, we found the word in the treasure room, y'all. But we just were like obnoxious because we were still human, okay. So then what happened? I'm going somewhere here. Trust me. I'm going somewhere. I always am going somewhere. If you'll just stay on board, I'm going somewhere. So what happened was there was this backlash because people were like, annoyed and offended at us and probably rightly so so then what people started doing is kind of putting the word of the word down it was kind of like a little gentle reaction in christendom of like don't quote the word at me 
So you see what I'm saying? Again, those people had a real thing, but they were human. And so I'll tell you what happened to me. And this is where I'm going. So one time I was sitting there, word of faith girl, and I'm just now learning that I'm obnoxious. It was an epiphany because I've never been obnoxious before. Never. <laughs> I'm searching your eyes to see if you believe me. But really, I was not. I had not been obnoxious before. It made me obnoxious. And, um, and so I was starting to realize, whoa, there's a world out there. You know what? Uh, somebody, if they don't admit they're sick, how can we pray for them? You know, don't just slap people. There's a, stop Bible thumping, right? And so I heard this guy speaking, and he was trying to help people make this shift, and he made this statement. He said, he was British, so I hear it with a British accent, but I'm not going to do that. But it's in my head that way. He said, he said, I mean, really, he said, the Trinity in heaven, come on, get real. It's not Father, Son, Holy Spirit, and Bible. Now, he said that. He was making a point. You see the point he was making? Like, quit beating people up with the word because it's the spirit of God that matters. That's absolutely true. And yet, when he said it, something in my heart hurt. And you know, I now know what it was. It's not Father, Son, Holy Spirit, and Bible. But Jesus is the Logos. Yes. It's Father, Son, and Word. I can't explain to you how the word is a person, but it is. And every word in that miraculous book right here, when it is alive with his spirit, really is part of the Trinity. Yeah. So the last slide is a picture of what's, this is somebody's painting that's a thing called perichoresis. And what perichoresis means is that the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit aren't lonely. They're having fellowship before the throne. And the amazing thing is that fellowship... Do you think the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit have good fellowship? They love each other. They talk about things. They talk about us. They love life. They have fellowship before the throne. The amazing thing of Christianity is you're welcomed into that fellowship. God says, come on in and sup with us and join our fellowship. This perichoresis is open to us. Jesus is human. There's a human before the throne fellowshipping with the Father and the Holy Spirit, and we're opened, welcome into that. But guess what? That same Jesus is also the Logos. He is the Word. So what I want to say to you and to that man back 20 years ago, yeah, the Word kind of is before the throne. The Word kind of is before the throne. Not a dry word, not a legalistic word, not a checklist word, but a liberating word. There are words, and that is why I love that picture, because that artist painted fellowship, right? He painted the fact that there, that's what he was trying to paint, is just circles of love and communication. And all I want to tell you today is that worship, your experience in worship, the worship team can go ahead and, and come on up, your experience in worship, as you're with God, he has words, the book of Hosea says, take with you words and return to him. But do you know he does that for you? He wants to take with him words and whisper them into your heart. The words of the Bible, one of the greatest, greatest things. If you come from a religious background where people have hurt you with words, bludgeoned you with words of the Bible, the, one of the greatest things God wants to do for you at some time is re-speak those words where you see them in the light of grace. You know, a lot of people read the Psalms and they think, you know, it talks about the ways of a righteous man. And I feel so sorry for people who read them and think they have to earn that righteousness or perform at that righteousness. Everything you read about the promises and the blessings of a righteous man, that's us because of Jesus. Right. We could never have earned that righteousness. He gives us that by grace. The cross earned that righteousness. Therefore, we qualify for all the good of those promises. So I promise you, if ever words, have, words of the Bible have scared you, made you feel religious, you know, constraint, scruple, you know, just don't know which way to move, God wants to re-speak those. Just like Paul rediscovered the whole of the Old Testament in the light of the cross, God has some things for you to discover. 
Maybe it's not just the words of the Bible. You can go ahead and just uh, make some music behind us there whenever you're ready. It may not just be that. People may have spoken some words. You know, all the fellowship you have on earth isn't beautiful like the fellowship of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit before the throne, is it? And so there may have been family units on earth that have spoken words that were hurtful. There may have been church authorities on earth that have spoken words that were hurtful. And I just know whether it's today or maybe on the worship night, maybe when we have this longer time to get lost in worship and be with him, God wants to speak some different words to you. God has an aha moment for you in his presence. He has many of them. If there are problems that you have wrestled with and you just cannot find the way through, if there are impasses in your life and you're at the limit of your natural mind and maybe this morning you're even in your heart admitting that you're fixated on a certain aspect. First of all, I want to say to you, there is no condemnation. God knows how he made you. The ability to analyze things in your mind is not meant to be a detriment. He wants to pull that slide bar back show you the big picture and release your thinking abilities the right way. So I just believe as we're here in his presence at the end, if you just tune your heart in before the Lord and just let him talk to you. You might want to close your eyes. You don't have to. But I know we sing, he's a good, good father. And he is. But he doesn't want you just singing that by faith. He wants you to experience it. So this morning, Lord, we just come to you, your people. And we just offer ourselves as your children. Lord, for some of us, we just need to hear a new word from you. Just to know you're there. But for some of us, we need to hear an old word re-spoken from the place of healing that your voice represents. Lord, I thank you for aha moments from heaven all over this room in people. Lord, I know when the world gets excited about a thing, I know you have that and more. And I know that you have moments, epiphanies, aha moments, eurekas. Lord, you have things you want to do in some people that are so big that it'll send them off shouting. And then you also have things that you want to do in the very secret, quiet place. So Lord, right now, we just release your spirit to work in your people. We thank you that we have been welcomed into the very fellowship before the throne of God. But this morning, we also thank you. <laughs> it's not just silent there. There are words. I just release words from God. Words. There are words before the throne, the Lord says. The Lord says, look for the words that are for you. Because I have words with your name on it. I have words that are waiting there for you. Out of my love, I've spoken to you. These things I've said that your joy, that my joy would remain in you and that your joy would be full. In any place in your life this morning where your joy is not full, there are words. We take with us words in the old covenant. Israel needed to take with them words of repentance, but in the new covenant, he runs at us with his words of release. There's some of you that have been trying so hard to repent on the inside. And God's got words for you right now. That work's been done. Receive the release. God, I thank you you have words. And I thank you that as we worship, we're going to learn to be hearers as well as seers. We're going to open the canvas of our hearts and minds to life transformation that comes from who you are. 
Because all of this is you being who you are. We give you thanks. We give you thanks for the book. And we dare to go into the treasure room and dust it off. Remove the rubble. We refuse to leave any of what you provided for us untapped. In Jesus' mighty name.
Father, we love you. We thank you so much that you are not just one thing. You're not just a particle. You're not just energy. But you show up in any way that we need you. And regardless of how you choose to show up, you still are the word of truth in everything. God, I just pray that that continues to seep in and, and hit the core of who we are, the core of our understanding. We really want to understand the multifaceted way of your, of your being. So God, I just thank you. Lord, I thank you for the word today. I thank you for the message. Give Pastor Perry Ann another hand. What an incredible delivery of truth this morning. We wanna, we wanna thank you for coming this morning. If you are a first time guest, we would love to meet you. Our leadership team would love to meet you. We have a gift for you. If you could meet us um, to your right, my left, um, into our dining room, we would love to get a gift in your hand and say hi. Also, um, if you're signing up for baptisms, please see the Welcome Center on your way out. And I hope that you guys are, remember our worship night next week and Pastor Appreciation. And we will see you next week. Thank you. Love you guys. strangers the king and the beggar bleed the same we've all got a sickness a terminal condition we medicate it but the pain won't go away see the eyes of a million faces looking for it in a million places only one can save us jesus you are the